Hi, Heidi. Hi, Barb. Hi, Deb. Hi, everybody. Hi, Alice. Hi, Benita. Alethea, Michael. <laughs> Cheryl. Barb. Uh, Michael, there's a Raven Santana. She's a reporter. Yes, that's NJ Spotlight News. And Lyndon Washburn. Oh, Lyndon. my friend. The, re the record. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, 10.59, so I will be letting them all in in yes. about 30 seconds. Everyone, please mute your phones except for Debbie. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I am Debbie White, and I'm the president of HPAE. And we're here to talk about the results of the survey we conducted earlier this year. We have several speakers and local leaders joining us today, all registered nurses, all who will share with you their personal experiences in hospitals. You will hear common themes with us. We have Alice Barden, an RN and Local 5004 president from Englewood Hospital. We have Benita Herndon, an RN and Local 5089 president from University Hospital. And we have Cheryl Mount, an RN and local president from 5105 um, Virtual Memorial Hospital. They'll speak in just a moment. Um, we also have Barbara Rosen with us today, who will not speak, and we have Michael Allen, Heidi Hansen, and Alethea Dixon, who've all helped immensely with this press conference and um, in the survey as well. So let me get into an overview. HPAE contracted with a professional polling company, Change Research, to survey nurses who are working in hospitals, or, or who have recently worked in hospitals in the past three years. We wanted to understand the impact the pandemic had on our workforce as these nurses had to deal with enormous numbers of suffering and dying people. They did it unprotected and that caused many to be infected, some with long lasting side effects and some actually died as a result of workplace exposure. Many nurses too suffered trauma from working in this terrifying environment. So we wanted to assess the mental health of our nurses as well. We've heard a lot of anecdotal stories from our members of large numbers of nurses migrating out of hospitals and that there is a critical staffing crisis unlike any we've seen in history. But we wanted the data and we wanted to see if the data said exactly what we've been hearing. Change Research conducted several focus groups in May of this year and a poll that ran from August 10th to August 16th that looked for input from bedside facing, AKA hospital nurses in New Jersey. We hoped for 400 respondents and we got 512. The results were so chilling and much more alarming than we imagined. And if we don't take concrete steps to fix this, 
our health system, healthcare system, especially in hospitals, will be in serious trouble. In fact, I would pose based on this survey that we are already in deep, deep trouble. In short, the data revealed that nearly 30%, almost one third of the nurses that worked in hospitals over the past three years have left the bedside within the last three years. That's three in 10 that are no longer staffing our hospitals. And of those who remain, almost three quarters have considered leaving. Of the newer nurses of zero to five years experience, 95% say that they're considering leaving hospitals. This highlights the fact that though we are desperately attempting to train, train and recruit new nurses, they will continue to leave the profession as quickly as they've entered it. Moreover, considering the fact that unsafe staffing is the number one reason for leaving the profession, new nurses simply will not stay if we don't address the work environment. Nurses also said that despite the fact that the pandemic is over, and I say that in quotes, nurses continue to leave hospitals. The stress they live with every day pushes them out the door. Fair wages was a third reason why nurses leave. Staffing was also the number one reason why nurses report a decline in patient safety and quality of care. Nurses in this survey described staffing levels that set them up for failure, and many feel they've been put in situations that jeopardize their nursing license. Three out of four, or 75% of nurses rate staffing in hospitals as poor or not good. Here to talk about her own personal experience with the staffing crisis is Alice Barden, an RN, an HBAE Local 5004 president at Englewood Hospital and Medical Center. Alice. Hi, everyone. As Debbie said, I'm Alice Barden. I'm the president of HBAE Local 5004. I have been a nurse for over 22 years. Um, and um, <clears throat> it's horrible right now. The, there was a nursing shortage before the pandemic began. The pandemic only exacerbated what was already there. And now that we're on the, as Debbie said, other side of the pandemic, it has gotten even worse. Nurses are still showing up to work because we are dedicated, but it really took a toll on us. The pandemic was traumatic. I don't think there is any area or any sect of life that was not impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. And as healthcare workers and frontline workers, we were there on the front lines. We were in the war zone. We were showing up. We were sacrificing it all sacrificing our health, sacrificing the health of our family members, because we wanted to show up and be there for our patients. We are nurses, we are caring, that is what we do. And despite that, our employers have not shown us the respect that we need or we deserve as a result of it. And now that we are on the other side of it and we continue to show up, staffing numbers are horrible. It's no secret nurses have left the bedside in droves for various reasons. They were just traumatized. They were beat down and they couldn't handle it anymore. And those of us that are still there, we are doing our best to continue to carry the mantle. We're still trying to show up for our patients and do what we need to do. And it's hard when you don't have the resources that you need. As Debbie pointed out, you know, nurses leave in droves. And there's so many studies that speak to the fact of the nurse patient ratio affecting outcomes. And not only do we need the nurses at the bedside to provide the best outcomes for our patients, which is totally what it's all about and what we want, we need it for our own personal health. Nurses are coming to work day after day, short staff, 
not a not able to get time off from work, not able to take vacations because there is no staff to fill in when they're gone. Even if you are lucky to get the time off, you're constantly being called on your days off or even on vacation, like you're out of the country, you return and there's just messages. Can you come to work today? Can you come to work today? There's just no time. And then you're at work and you're experiencing moral injury because you are there to do the best for your patients, but you just don't have the resources to do it. You don't have the ancillary staff to do it. You don't have the professional staff to do it. And you are doing it all and you're trying your hardest and you're trying your best and you can't survive this way. And it's twofold, you know, nurses are coming in and they're leaving the bedside and you have to look at the workforce. As Debbie pointed out, newer nurses um, don't seem to have the same, for lack of a better word, dedication to a particular job. They're dedicated to the profession, but, you know, like, with people that are my age group, we come and we're dedicated and you work at a job. I've been at my job for 22 years, but the newer nurses, you have to give them incentives. So you have to look at the whole picture. With my employer, we have been asking to meet with them since December of 2021 to say, hey, guys, we're bleeding nurses. No, we're not just bleeding nurses. We're hemorrhaging nurses. They are leaving. We need to come together to the table and have a realistic conversation about the state of affairs of nursing and figure out what it is that we need to do to not only recruit new nurses into the facility, but to also retain those nurses and to retain the nurses that you have. To this day, we have not met with management if it's meeting with deaf ears. We have labor management meetings and they say, we'll have a response, we're ready, we're ready next month, next month, next month. Next month has never come. How can you look us in our face and say, you respect us, you look at us as healthcare heroes, you know, we're the pandemic heroes and you're the greatest and you do what you do. And we're so happy that you show up every day and you care for our patients and you nurse them back to health when you won't even sit at the table and have a realistic conversation with us about what needs to happen in order to get nurses at the bedside. We want to have a conversation with our leadership team to have a co comprehensive look at what's needed. That includes wages, that includes the ability to get time off work, that includes the ability to get time off work, not only just for resting, but also time away from the bedside for continuing education. Nursing is a lifelong profession of learning. You never know it all. You are continuously learning and we can't even get away from the bedside for even in-house training and education, let alone out-house training and education because, because there's just no staff. So we keep going because this is what we do and we love our patients and we have good relationships with our coworkers, but we're, we're drowning and I don't know how long it's gonna be before we hit rock bottom. I mean, I, we're, we're, we're there. <laughs> And yet we keep going, but I don't know how much longer we can we can go on like this. Thank you so much, Alice. I don't think Alice's uh, experience is any different from any other leader in um, in our union. I want to now introduce Benita Herndon. She's an she's an emergency department nurse, and mm -hmm. she's president of the nurses, the HPA nurses at local five hundred eight nine at University Hospital in Newark the only, by the way, state-owned hospital in New Jersey. Benita, can you tell us about your experiences? Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Benita Herndon. Um, I've been a nurse at um, University Hospital in Newark for more than 21 years. Um, like Debbie said, University is the only public hospital in New Jersey. And I can't state that more times than 10 since I think we deserve uh, some special attention from the government. Um, but while working in emergency bar department, better known as the gatekeeper um, to the hospital, it has been no easy feat for us. Um, I've survived many medical barriers, infectious disease outbreaks and other epidemics, but COVID-19 <laughs> has by far been our most dangerous in the time that I've worked. I've survived Ebola, loss of fever, H1N1, and other diseases, but COVID-19 has changed our landscape. 
COVID-19 transformed our staffing crisis that we already had, but it magnified it into an enormous beast. We, the nurses, now have to achieve so much with just little resources. In the hospital, there has been a decline in staffing across all disciplines. I would love to just talk about just the nurses, but I can't because now I'm required to fulfill some of their responsibilities. So I must say I'm the respiratory therapist because if there's only four on in a day, so I have to go give a respiratory treatment. I have to manipulate the vent. Um, I have to be the lab technician. Uh, if they can't come and draw the labs, I have to draw the labs or we have to drop it off to the labs. I have to be transportation because I don't have anyone to transport patients to diagnostic studies. So I have to transport them to diagnostic studies. Uh, dietary aid, um, they're short. So I have to piece a meal together out of whatever resources that I have in the refrigerated air. Just, that's just to name a few. So as I speak to you, coming from the front line, um, I'm just taken back that this is the only state-owned facility and, and we're in Newark and we, we're struggling. We're struggling with um, overcrowding waiting rooms. Um, that has multiplied uh, since New York had their issues over there with getting an the influx of patients. So it has increased in our waiting room as well because Newark is a sanctuary state. Uh, we're treating patients with um, higher acuities now. They're very sick. Um, and that's dangerous because I have more new nurses, young nurses on the front line. They have never had any experience. And now I just, we just throw them out there and to take care of these very sick patients. These patients require more specialized care. Um, they're waiting longer to see a provider. Um, there's delay in diagnostic studies. Like I said, you know, I mentioned before, we, we, we are, we're behind on everything. So I don't even have a MRI tech, uh, a CAT scan tech. It's just one for the whole facility. So, so we're often having longer wait times to get those diagnostic studies done. There's a delay in receiving the test results. And, and oh, let us not forget the mental health patients that linger from Christie administration. So they're clogging up our wait times too. So, um, and, and now we have a new influx of newly diagnosed patients. So, and um, with mental health crisis and they are having a poor throughput as well. Um, this group still remains um, a priority to us as well as other um, things, but we're, we're just left in, with no social service support or interventions. Um, as the odds stack against us, I mean, university, um, we have a poor infrastructure um, that we're dealing with right now. Something is always breaking down. We're always having a flood. Something always happened that, um, that leaves us in limbo. Um, we continue to work with fewer medical and social resources, but because we're the state of New Jersey hospital, uh, we're not sus um, sus um, efficiently funded by the state like we're supposed to be. As I point out, as I point the finger at the state of New Jersey um, and like the governor and his constituents, they're responsible for us and nobody's holding them accountable. So you can imagine that all these problems that are causing the exodus of staff from our hospital and other hospitals is 10 times on us at university. Thank you. Thank you, Benita. Um, and just to point out um, a little more of what Benita was talking about, because we're underfunded at University Hospital, there is no um, way to recruit based on wages because the state doesn't fund enough for them to offer comparable wages. Um, and I uh, would offer this as a plug for the state to please fund your only state-owned hospital. But to the staffing crisis, make no mistake, unsafe staffing has been an issue for many years. The pandemic did not cause it. The pandemic exacerbated bad staffing. In hospitals, traditionally, staffing has been a line item that's been cut down to its lowest amount in order for hospitals to maximize on their profits. 
for years as a union, we've talked about unsafe staffing. And now the pandemic has so exacerbated a chronic problem created by hospitals themselves that I think that we're at a crossroads. We must address this now. Saving money is not an issue. We need to save patients. And connect the connection between better staffing and better patient outcomes has long been proven. I believe Benita spoke to this and Alice spoke to this. There are multiple research studies showing that patient mortality, we're not just talking about bad outcomes, mortality, mortality, death, decreases with better nurse staffing. For instance, each one patient added to a nurse's workload is associated with a 7% increase in death following general surgery. One more patient in an assignment is associated with a 6 to 9% increase in hospital readmissions for certain diagnoses like heart attack, pneumonia, heart failure. And by far the most prevalent reason for low retention of staff in hospitals is poor staffing. And those things have been well cited. They're across the internet. I can give you the study if you need to see it. But now on to another leader's personal example. Cheryl Mount is an RN. She's the president of Local 5105 at Virtual Memorial Hospital. And she can tell you what she's seen. Cheryl? Sorry, on mute. Thank you, Debbie. Um, my name is Cheryl Mount. I work at Virtua and um, at the South Jersey, Central Jersey Hospital. Um, this is my 37th year as a nurse. Um, I started when I was two. No. Um, nursing, um, I have a few catchphrases that I use. Um, one of my catchphrases is, nursing is broken. Uh, I said this before the, the pandemic um, um, for many reasons, but um, staffing has been an issue um, that our local and nationwide have been dealing with um, way before the pandemic. And we've been shouting from the mountaintops, just as Debbie, Alice, and Benita said, um, staffing directly um, relates to patient safety. Um, also, there's been um, another catchphrase I use, um, do more with less. This seems to be um, what big corporate healthcare, um, big business um, feels is the best way they can make money. Let's do more with less. After the pandemic, um, my, I have a new catchphrase. I don't use nursing as broken. Um, I use nursing as shattered. Um, for all the reasons that, that Debbie, Benita, and Alice have already said, many are leaving the field. Uh, many have retired, retired early. Many have taken travel positions and finally are getting paid what they're worth. Uh, many are leaving the field altogether. Um, I have personally dreamed of working at Wawa and just making coffee. Um, that's my dream job. Um, vacancy rates are the highest I have ever seen. Um, and I'm talking about vacancy rates on units that typically you don't see these high vacancy rates. Um, vacancy rates mean, when I say that, I mean open positions for not only nurses, but nursing assistants, um, environmental services, lab, um, respiratory techs, transport services. Um, on some of the nursing units, uh, med surge, 50%. Uh, that means that we are down 50% of the people that we need to run this unit. ER, OR, and procedural areas are well above 60%. Uh, one of our departments, our cardiac cath lab, only has one part-time employee. Um, so I did the math. Um, that is a 95% vacancy rate. Pretty scary. Um, and like I said, ancillary staff, have, and Alice has said, and Benita's is the ancillary staff, um, are a nurse's right hand. They do, um, they support us. Without them, we are doing the work, um, including emptying the trash, 
making the beds, transporting patients, drawing labs. This is all time taken away from actually caring, um, doing the duties of a nurse. Um, I also have, a, I'll give you another catchphrase. I have said this before, and I have I've actually talked about it in, in a, another um, interview that I had, that I feel like I'm living in an alternate reality. Um, there's my inside life in the hospital and the outside life. And I, I'm just shocked um, that the public doesn't know What's going on inside the hospital as far as the staffing crisis? Um, does the public know that, you know, there, there's not enough staff in the, in the hospital to take care of them when they get there? I, I'm not so sure. I, I, I've heard things in the media, but it, I don't think it's portrayed in the criticalness that it needs to be portrayed. My fear, and this is the fear, I, I talk about this a lot. My fear is there is not going to be enough people nurses or, or um, ancillary staff at the bed, bedside to take care of people. Um, it's going to be an absolute crisis. And, you know, I'm, you know, the reality I struggle with is why people don't know this. Um, you know, examples, and you see it slowly inching up. And I think Alice um, talked about this. It's no better. It's actually worse now than it was you know, a year ago. So you think, oh, the pandemic's over, it's going to get better. It's not, it's worse. Um, ratios, um, when I talk about ratios, it's how many patients one nurse has in their assignment that they're, they're um, you know, that they take care of. Um, we're seeing uh, ratios over the past weekend of eight to one. Um, and this is on a med surge floor, and um, that means that that nurse is responsible for caring for eight patients. How much time can she give to her eight patients? She's not only caring for the eight patients, but she's also doing all the ancillary work required to care for that patient. In our PCU, and PCU is Progressive Care Unit, that's um, a unit where um, most people are coming directly out of the ICU, and acuity is very, very high, and they're um, on monitors and certain life-saving drips. Acuity, the um, patient ratio this weekend was seven to one on days. Um, that is very dangerous and unsafe. Um, so I'd like to talk about solutions. A lot of people say, sure, what's, what's, how are we gonna fix this? Is it even fixable? Is it too late? And you know, I, I think we have a lot of work to do but I think about it in two different goals or two different sections. We have retention of the nurses that we have already there at the bedside. How are we going to keep them doing the work that they're trained to do? And recruitment of new people, nurses, talent into the field to take our spots when we finally want to retire. So re retention, um, we have to fix the do more with less mentality. Um, there's only so much more you can do um, before you break um, and can't do it no more. And that's where we're at now. So we need to fix the do more with less mentality. We need our support staff back. We need safe working environments. Everyone deserves to go to work and feel safe. I can tell you during this pandemic, and even after the pandemic, to be quite honest, there was um, a feeling where, you know, we are not safe. Um, and I think it's evident in, in, the, in the, um, the data that that be presented. Fair wages. You know, when you talk about money, people go, oh, you know, the hospital can't afford it. Um, they can. Um, and here's what I struggle with. I know they're making a lot of money off the work that us nurses are doing. And I also know that one person, one CEO of the hospital, one person should not be making millions of dollars. Um, and they can't tell us that they can't give us a raise. Uh, you know, over the last 10 years, we've been getting subpar raises while bonuses and, um, you know, salaries of CEOs have soared um, to to basically ridiculous numbers. 
um, life work balance. When I, when I, you know, nurses, we've always been the ones to, to, to kind of suck it up and, you know, work extra. And, you know, that's what right now um, it, the hospitals are surviving on. All part-time and full-time people picking up extra shifts to even keep staffing levels what they are. I was surprised to see that work-life balance was as low as it is, as it is, but I think it's just a statement that staffing is such a critical issue that it's way above um, us nurses, uh, you know, deserving a life-work balance. But one of the big things that's happening right now is you're seeing um, denial of PTO, um, you know, at the bare, bare minimum, um, you know, it's, you're already stressed out and you can't get a day off at that. That's going to keep a lot of people are going to walk away from that. And, and until they fix that and have a, a, a life work balance, that's even you know, comparable to working at Wawa, serving coffee, you know, you're not going to get nurses to come to stay. Um, and then recruitment is the second part of this. If you don't fix retention, you're never going to get people to come into this field. Um, I get, um, you know, there's been a, a big, a lot of talk about education and educators and nursing educators, and that's true. Um, they need to fix that portion of it. But until they fix what's going on inside the hospitals, no one's w going to want to do this job. Um, I think employers, hospitals, big business need to listen to the nurses. And until they do, this problem's not going to be fixed. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. That was a mouthful. And uh, it was. A lot of, I, and again, as I said, with Alice and Benita, not an isolated perception. I'm sure Benita and Alice completely can. And I know Alice and Benita both agreed in their in their uh, in their words they shared with us as well. But I, I want to. I we're going to wrap this up, and I just want to leave you with a couple quotes. First. The surveyor who ran focus groups posed a question um, to the group at the end of the discussion she had with her focus group. And her question was, is there anything else you want us to know? One nurse answered and said, you know, it's not safe in hospitals right now, right? After she asked this question, there was silence for a few moments. And then one by one, each of the nurses in that focus group agreed. And the surveyor sent, said that it sent chills down her spine. One other nurse said, and this I think has been shared by all the nurses here. I don't think, and this is a quote, I don't think we've seen the complete fallout of nursing. The nurses that are still at the hospital just continue to get more and more burned out. They're gonna leave and there's gonna be so much inexperience in the hospital. It's gonna be very, very scary. We need the pipeline. And this is, that was the end of the quote. We need the pipeline addressed into the profession. We need expanded nursing programs, residency programs, tuition incentives, and tax forgiveness, uh, tax incentives and tuition forgiveness. All those things are good. We need expansion of, of, of advanced degrees, yes. But we have yet to address staffing in any meaningful way. We have a bill. We need action taken on the bill. Alethe, I believe, put the bill in the chat. Um, but we need this issue addressed. We need it addressed now, or we will continue to see nurses leaving the profession. And where is that going to leave us as patients, as consumers ourselves? Thank you. Do we have any questions? I think the survey really did speak for itself. And by the way, if you have a question that can be answered, 
um, by one of the surveyors, we do have a contact um, listed for you. Okay. Thank you for coming, everyone. We'll see you later. Everybody good work, very nice.